Hey, remember in the beginning of the pandemic when we were joking about how nature was healing while we were all stuck inside? Well, the reality was climate change was worsening, and it's only gotten worse in the past year and a half, just as it has every year for decades. And now parts of Europe and China are decimated after deadly floods swept through, killing more than 200 people with many more missing and destroying homes, key infrastructure, and the habitats of countless animals. At the same time, devastating wildfires and heat waves have been raging in Canada, Siberia, and the Pacific Northwest, killing hundreds of people and over a billion animals, overwhelming hospitals and shutting down businesses. Now, as scientists have warned for decades, this escalating extreme weather is the result of climate change, and it'll only get worse if we don't take swift and bold action to address it. President Joe Biden's $973 billion infrastructure bill addresses some of those concerns by providing funding to repair bridges, roads and rails, improving access to renewable energy, promising to cap abandoned oil and gas wells, and offering tax credits on the purchases of electric vehicles. But surprise, surprise, it's currently stalled in the Senate. And anyway, experts and activists say the bill only scratches the surface of drastic measures that are needed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in an essay for the New York Times, one of my next guests argues it's not just an environmental emergency we're fighting, it's a public health crisis too. Quote, it's a simple and deadly formula. The greater our emissions of heat trapping gases, the higher the temperature rise and the greater the health risks. And joining me now are Susan Joy Hassel, the co-author of that Times essay and the director of the nonprofit Climate Communication, and David Cash, the dean of UMass Boston's McCormick School of Policy and Global Studies. Welcome to both of you. Susan, I, I, I want to start with you. I mean, we all talk about the weather, right? Now we all talk about the climate. They're different things, as I hope people know by now. But it has indeed been getting hotter, and it's getting and hotter. It's getting hotter like places in Siberia, which is astonishing. Yeah, we're seeing extreme heat in places we never expected to see it before. You know, a, a town in Russia that calls itself the Pole of Cold has recently registered over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in temperature. So we're seeing some really extraordinary heat. And we've always known that in a warming climate, we would see more heat. So it's not surprising. In fact, the extremes are increasing much more than the average temperature. And the thing about heat, which I think we have grown here in the United States not to notice because of our air conditioning, and we still have, even before this, this crisis, we have at least 12,000 Americans who die every year directly related to heat problems. And yes. with the crisis happening in places in the United States where air conditioning isn't the usual thing, like the Northwest, we're going to see more of that, right? Well, absolutely. Um, people in the areas of the South are more acclimated to extreme heat. They have air conditioning, they're physiologically more acclimated, and so it doesn't affect them as much. What happens in the, you know, as the world gets warmer, though, is you get these heat waves in places like the Pacific Northwest, where very few people have air conditioning, or in Canada, where very few people do. And then you see really bad outcomes. And, you know, we've seen that we saw that in the European heat wave in 2003, where 70,000 people died from an extreme heat wave because they're not set up for that kind of heat. And, you know, you mentioned 12,000 Americans on average die each year from the heat. It's the most deadly form of extreme weather we have in the U.S. And if we continue on a path of increasing emissions, that number will go up to maybe 100,000 Americans a year. So, David, um, you know, policymakers, lawmakers, scientists are, are, are needed now. They need to juggle two things. They need to work at trying to reduce our exposure, if you will, and also plan and adapt for what's what's happening. How are they doing that? And do you think that people are all hands on deck and doing it right now? Yeah, so so first, if I could just say, Susan, that, that piece was an amazing piece and so important right now. This kind of message um, is so critical. And it, it's, it is the last two weeks have just been a, uh, a clarion call, as there have been so many of those. And the call is to do just what, uh, what, what, what you're saying needs to happen. We need to be energizing, making swift, bold policy changes now. And in some quarters, that's happening. And in some quarters, there is resistance, a resistance that I don't really understand because 
I happened to be out in the Pacific Northwest two or three weeks ago, and I was at a farm, and a huge percentage of their crops have, were destroyed by the 113 degree temperature. We were by the Cascade Mountains. They had never, ever gotten that kind of heat before. These are farmers, agricultural interests, communities that depend on agriculture. And we know, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, Susan, you, you have, have said this, we know that who are hurt most, who have the most difficulty bouncing back? It's those who are most vulnerable. It's black and brown communities. It's low income communities. It's those income, it's those, those communities who have been most damaged by the fossil fuel uh, sector anyway. So the opportunities are huge. We've got to respond. Uh, so that we can reduce our emissions. And there's so many tools in our toolboxes. Like there what? are incentives. Let's, yeah, let's talk okay. about a couple so, of those tools. Sure. There's some, there's some kind of broad ones that, that the consumers won't even know about, except that they will see cleaner air and not have all of these events happen. And that is many states already have an incentives where utilities have to provide more renewable energy. Some of you might have heard the uh, clean energy standard, which is the next generation of these being discussed by Democrats and Republicans, that provides what's an invisible incentive for consumers, but that utilities have to respond to. And what you see, as you have in all of these states, is an explosion of solar and wind and new, now electric vehicles, all of whom, which, by the way, when they do get to the consumer level, they're psyched about it. How many homeowners in Massachusetts look at their neighbors and are like, solar panels? You guys are paying zero electricity bills every month? I want that. I want that. Those are the kinds of incentives that policymakers should be putting in, in, in place. And they should be looking toward the equity questions. Right. There's, I, I was going to say, say there's huge. Oh, go ahead. No, you go. There's a huge growth opportunity of jobs in this space. Solar installers, those who come to your home to, to audit your homes and then put in the right energy efficiency equipment or insulation, those are jobs that you can't outsource, by the way. And those we should be focusing, again, on these most vulnerable communities, those communities who have been economically hit in the last five years, those communities, black and brown communities who have historically uh, taken on the biggest burden, the, the opportunities are tremendous. Susan, right da da David is, is talking about the, the other two prongs, like we have to work to protect mm -hmm. our vulnerable communities mm -hmm. that have historically mm -hmm. been impacted, and we have to talk to folks regarding their, their, their wallets, right? And, mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. As we're watching the temperature change in Maine and the ticks are going mm -hmm. crazy and suddenly you have all these, these illnesses that you didn't have before, the crops are an issue. Do you think mm -hmm. the best path, Susan, to, to, to address the, the majority who are just feeling this tick tock tick, you know, year after year, things are getting a little bit worse, but on, on the big sc scope of things, it's a disaster happening. How do we reach people? <laughs> That's the big question, isn't it? I can't help but think that the sort of temper tantrum of weather that we're having right now is a really good way to reach people. Um, when it's hot and dry, people make that connection with climate change, at least most people do. Some of the other connections are a little more subtle and people don't intuitively make them. For example, the heavy rain and flooding, people don't intuitively connect that with climate change, but we know that a warmer world, a warmer atmosphere holds more moisture. So when a given storm system comes through, all that rain dumps out at once. So we get these very heavy rain events that cause tremendous flooding. So, and there are other ways, for example, you know, hurricanes get stronger because of the warm ocean water. And we're seeing that and we see more rain coming in hurricanes. And most of the damage in hurricanes is due to flooding, actually, more than winds. So we have to help people understand that. Part of it is the media's job. The media don't talk about climate change as much as I guess I think they should. And they don't always connect the dots between the extreme weather that people are experiencing and climate change. So there'll be lots of stories about the wildfires, but the stories aren't mentioning climate change as part of that story. And I think that's really an important part of what we have to do. But we do have to wake people up. And I think that the clarion call, as you put it, that we're seeing from our environment, these unnatural disasters, are a really good way to begin to wake people up if these connections are made for them. And you know, the good news is that the future's in our hands. We get to decide if we wanna have an ever worsening set of disasters like we're experiencing now, or if we wanna have a better future. That's our call. And that's what we need to do. We have to let our leaders know that we prioritize climate 
and we want to speed up the clean energy revolution that's already underway. We're not starting from scratch, but we have to do more and we have to do it faster. David, I, I keep telling people, um, when I, you know, civilian folks in the real world, I keep telling them that when insurance companies start telling you we're not going to insure you, or your mm -hmm. rates are going to be so high you can't afford to live here, that that's mm -hmm. going to be the tipping point for a lot of people to understand. But are towns and cities ready to start evacuating people or to, and buy their homes back? I mean, do you see policymakers preparing to have those discussions? So the, the discussions have started already, and there are a couple of communities throughout the United States that are exploring this. It's, of course, an incredibly difficult conversation to have because people are uh, married to their place, married to their community, but it's not going to be the same community that it's always been. And so uh, I, I think the, the wise and mature thing to do for cities and towns is to start having these conversations, especially those cities and towns where uh, they, people are most vulnerable, where floods have repeated time after time, where heat becomes a big issue. Um, those conversations have to happen and they're not gonna be easy. None of this is gonna be easy, but those conversations have to happen. And are you seeing younger people, young adults, college students coming in? You know, I know, uh, are the, do they feel like this is just how it's gonna be or are you feeling there's a passion to make change and to at least adapt to the world that we've created? Can I judge this uh, based on my 25 and 22-year-old? Uh, yes. Uh, and if that's the case, the answer is absolutely yes. Both are incredibly passionate and very knowledgeable about this. And both have a lot of concerns and anxieties about the future. But, but that, that, uh, uh, that age of, of uh, person in our communities now are fired up, fired up about the opportunities, the opportunities of avoiding major problems and the opportunities for jobs, the opportunities for clean air, the opportunities to reduce energy costs, the opportunities to reduce our dependence on foreign oil. I mean, these are all big opportunities that because we have a hundred plus years of dependence, both politically and from a, you know, our, our uh, uh, how we run our economy perspective, really hard to wean ourselves from the fossil fuel industry, but we're starting. And it's a really important thing that that uh, that particular age group is going to have to really push and you know, we should all be apologizing that this is a big thing that we've laid on them that's going to be really challenging and hard. Well, I thank you both uh, for joining me today and I, I hope we can keep spreading the word. I appreciate you both. Susan Joy Hassel, David Cash, thanks for joining us today on Greater Boston. Mm -hmm. I appreciate okay. it. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks, thanks so much.